we had a, some meetings in Eatonville, Washington earlier this year. Is your mic turned on? It's not turned on. Testing, testing, testing. Is it on now? Testing, testing. Testing, testing. Testing, 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 it's the lights on. It is. It's on the standby. <laughs> um, anyway, this particular study that we're dealing with, earlier this year in Eatonville, Washington, we had a weekend where we dealt with this study fairly thoroughly, and then we also immediately thereafter went down to Colton, California, and did pretty much the same presentation. And this study is available in both the Eatonville and the Colton presentations. The Eatonville, I think, is 11 hours, and the Colton is 14 hours. Um, and we're going to bring this to a conclusion and then start making some points based upon this particular study. But for those of you that need to look a little bit more closely at this, I can recommend the Eatonville and Colton reading these presentations on this study. Um, once again, we're suggesting that the laddering message is a message. Some of you may not be familiar with the concept that the latter rain is a message. And if you turn to Zechariah chapter 4, in Zechariah chapter 4, um, all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world. But when the prophets become part of the prophecy, and the prophets sometimes do become part of the prophecy themselves, then the prophets are illustrating the end of the world. And when you see a prophet become part of the prophecy, he's illustrating the end of the world, and he's either he's either illustrating the Millerites or the 144,000, probably both. All right. um, this is pretty common understanding in Adventism. In Adventism, we understand it in Revelation chapter 10, that when John eats a little book and it's sweet in his mouth and then it becomes bitter in his stomach, that he represents the Millerites that go through this experience, 1840 to 1844, and that's the great disappointment. If you understand that is represented by John in chapter 10, say amen. amen. Okay. So you understand that John in Revelation chapter 10 is illustrating the Millerites, correct? But primarily he's representing 144,000. Because in verses 8 and 9 of Revelation 10, before he takes the little book and eats it, he's told that when he takes it and eats it, it will be sweet in his mouth and it will become bitter in his stomach. Therefore, he's representing the people that know about the Millerite experience before they enter into that experience. And that's the 144,000. And the Millerites did not understand the experience that they went through. Inspiration is very clear on that. So John in chapter 10 is representing both the Millerites and 144,000. And Zechariah here in chapter 4 is also representing the Millerites and 144,000. We don't have time to go through this. I want to make one little point. Um, and I may have thought not what it is again. In the beginning of chapter 4, he's awakened. Zechariah is awakened. Why do we have to know that he's awakened? He's illustrated as being awakened because he's representing the parable of the ten virgins. And the New York Herald, August 19, 1890, Sister White says, I'm often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter, for it has special application to our time. So the parable of the ten virgins was fulfilled to the very letter in the Millerite history. If you're not familiar with that history, it's a very controversy. Sister White identifies the Millerite history in terms of the fulfillment of the parable of the ten virgins in a very controversy. It's fulfilled to the very end again, and it's repeated at the end of the world in the history of the 144,000. In Zechariah chapter 4, Zechariah is awakened, and then in the interaction with the angel, he sees the seven branch candlestick, which everyone in this room knows is the candlestick in the holy place in the sanctuary. 
And Zechariah doesn't know what this candlestick is. He's representing the Millerites who were awakened at the midnight cry in August of 1844, believing that the sanctuary is the earth. And then on October 23rd, 1844, they have the command of Revelation 10 to rise and measure the temple of God. In other words, you had a misunderstanding about what the sanctuary was. You thought it was the earth. And now you have to come to understand what the sanctuary is. And this is what Zechariah is representing here in chapter 4. But it goes on. And it also is representing the 144,000. If you go to um, verse 6, or for, let's start at verse 4. After Zechariah doesn't understand the seven branch candlestick, a prophet that is raised up during the time period that they're rebuilding the temple doesn't understand what the seven branch candlestick is. It right? can't be Zechariah. He's representing the Millerites. And in verse 4, it says, And I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? You know this candlestick. Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest not thou, knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord of the Zerubbabel, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came into the same, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, his hand shall also finish it, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. Who has despised the day of small things, where they shall rejoice and shall see the coming in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven, they are the eyes of the Lord which run to and flow through the whole earth. And then I answered, then answered I, and said unto him, What are these two olive trees? And this is the point I want to make here. He says two olive trees, Zechariah does, and he doesn't understand what they are. Then I answered again and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which threw the gold, the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered and said, No, it's not what these be. And I said, No, my Lord. Now, there's a lot in those verses. I'm going to go through it real fast, um, just to put it in the record, and then I'm going to focus on the on this oil to try to make a point to lead into this presentation. Zechariah in chapter four is representing the Millerites and the hundred forty-four thousand who wake up during the midnight cry time period. And they don't understand what the furnishing of the temple is, the Millerites. But in terms of the hundred and forty-four thousand, they don't understand the work of the Holy Spirit at the end of the world. At the, at the end of the world. We believe that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is some supernatural empowerment that allows us to finish the work of overcoming sin and to bring in the sheaves and the final thing gathered. And the, the latter rain provides that power, but that's not really what the latter rain is. Lots of people in the world do not understand, and that's Zechariah here is portraying people that do not understand these things. The Millerites didn't understand the sanctuary. The 144,000 will be tested on how they understand the work of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain. And, and, and brothers and sisters, if this is a new concept for you, it shouldn't be. If you've studied 1888, the Lord tried to pour out the latter rain upon his people in 1888, and the majority of the brethren would not receive it because they had preconceived ideas about what the latter rain was, and they rejected it. So this is just a repeat of that history. God's people would not understand what the latter rain is when it comes. That's 1888, all over again. Um, it talks about this, about Zerubbabel. It says that Zerubbabel is going to lay the, the headstone and the footstone. And I don't want to spend a lot of time in there, but in Haggai 2, I think it's verse 19 or 20, the very last verse in, in Haggai, um, in verse 23, it says, In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, will I take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, saith the Lord, and will make thee as a signet, for I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. One of the things that Zerubbabel is, is he's a signet. Haggai 2, verse 23. Haggai 2, verse 23. Haggai is the, the, the book right before Zechariah. Zerubbabel is the signet in the Lord's hand, and Zerubbabel's name is two words combined, and it means offspring of Babylon. Okay? Zerubbabel means out of Babylon. Right? And Zerubbabel is the seal. And there was a sealing process that took place in the Millerite history in the Midnight Cry. That's what Brother Duane was dealing with this morning. 
with the Midnight Cry history of the Seven Month Movement from um, August through October of 1844, there was a sealing process illustrated, and that was the foundation of Adventism. And Zerubbabel lays the foundation, but he also lays the headstone because Zerubbabel, out of Babylon, in the fourth angel's message, which is also out of Babylon, is where the 144,000 are sealed. So the sealing process is something that isn't understood by God's people at the end of time, and this is one of the things that's being dwelt on by Zechariah in chapter 4. There's more to say about Zerubbabel um, in verse 10, but we're not going to. In verse 10, it says, raises the question concerning this truth, for who has despised the day of small things? And brothers and sisters, the day of small things is the beginning of the world. That's what Brother Dwayne was talking about this, this morning. If, if you don't understand the doctrines of Adventism, we're a progressive development of truths that were produced during the history of when these truths were brought together. And you understand the doctrines of Adventism simply as doctrines totally detached from this progressive revelation that took place in that history, then you really don't know what the doctrines are. And that progressive development of truth <coughs> that took place in the Mirarite time period is despised in Adventism. We look back at the Millerite history and we think, oh, a brother, a brother that, that Brother Dwayne was telling me about a brother that he listened to this, this Sabbath that was given such a, a spot on presentation on one point of truth. And I pointed out to him that the Sabbath before, he was in Arkansas saying, there isn't any truth on this chart. Okay, He despised the day of small things. And if you despise the day of small things, this is reference here. If you despise the beginning of Adventism, there's no way you're going to be involved with the end of Adventism on the right side of the issue. But then in verse 11, it talks about the oil that comes down through these two pipes. To submit to you that Zerubbabel is still, or that Zechariah here in chapter 4 is still illustrating God's people at the end of the world that have to understand the latter rain correctly. And if you have an Ellen White study Bible, underneath chapter 4, from manuscript 109, page 1897, she says, These empty themselves into the golden bowl. She's quoting Zechariah 4, 11 through 14. These empty themselves into the golden bowls, which represent the hearts of the living messengers of God who bear the word of the Lord and repeat it in warnings and in entreaties. The word itself must be, as represented, the golden oil, empty from the two olive trees that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. This is the baptism by the Holy Spirit with fire. This will open the soul of unbelievers to conviction. So this this golden oil in Zechariah is the baptism of the Holy Spirit by fire that opens our hearts. The golden oil is that. Now, if you have the Ellen White study Bible, just above that she has a quote. This is commenting on that from Review and Herald, February 3rd, 1903. And she says this By the holy beings surrounding his throne, the Lord keeps up a constant communication with the inhabitants of the earth. The golden oil represents the grace with which God keeps the lamps of the believers supplied. Were it not that this holy oil is poured from heaven in the messages of God's Spirit, the agencies of evil would have entire control over men. The golden oil is the messages that are brought to light to God's people. Were it not that this holy oil is poured out from heaven in the messages messages of God's Spirit, the agencies of evil would have entire control over men. God is dishonored when we do not receive the communications that he sends to us. Thus we refuse the golden oil which he would pour into our souls to be communicated to those that are apart from us. The latter rain is the golden oil and the latter rain is imparted to men and women through the messages that are brought to light from God's prophetic word. Amen. And the increase of knowledge that takes place in the history of 144,000 that parallels the increase of knowledge that took place in the middle of history. And when you go to Isaiah 28, when it's talking about how the latter rain, the refreshing, 
is going to be taught. The subject that is introduced in verse 9 of Isaiah 29 is, Whom shall ye teach knowledge, and whom shall understand doctrine? The question is raised, who's going to teach the increase of knowledge? And then the following verses tell how that, that knowledge is taught. It's line on line, here a little, there a little. And what we're saying here, what we've been doing so far in this presentation, is we've been bringing line upon line from God's Word together, and we're saying that this is the latter rain message. This is how the latter rain message is taught. And we've, we've put the history of Christ. It had a time at the end, his birth. John the Baptist formalized the message. John the Baptist's message was in power when a dove came down out of heaven at the baptism of Jesus. The Sanhedrin marks the, the, the activities of the enemy, the triumphal entry, the manifestation of power, the cross, the judgment. And I'm leaving some out because I don't want to spend a great deal of time on this. The three decrees. You might put me in mind. The three decrees. Time to the end. Fulfillment of the 70 years of captivity. Cyrus understands that it's time for the Jews to go back and build Jerusalem. He drags his feet. Michael comes down in Daniel 10 and straightens Cyrus out and powers his message. There's a decree to stop the work, activities of the enemies. The third decree returns national sovereignty to the Jews where they can execute judgment on the criminals in the land. Same. All these reform movements are the same. Um, Miller writes, 1798, time to the end. Miller formalizes the message, 1833. The message is empowered in 1840 when the mighty angel of Revelation 10 comes down. 1842, Protestant churches close their doors against the Millerite message. 1843, judgment begins. Midnight cry, manifestation of peril, power parallel in the triangle of entry. We did Moses last time, right? Moses' birth, time of the end. Moses is a type of Christ. Um, there is a time prophecy connected with Moses' birth. I don't know if Jamal told that to you, but we have the printout for you if you want to look more carefully at the 400 and the 430 year time prophecy of Abraham, you will find that the birth of Moses was a fulfillment of the prophecy, marking the time of the end. Moses is the one that formalizes the message. He formalizes the message at the burning bush. His message is empowered when the Lord comes down. Exodus chapter 5, with the test of circumcision. The test of circumcision is paralleling because Moses is a type of Christ. Test of circumcision is parallels in the baptism of Christ. Baptism, circumcision, interchangeable term. Um, Pharaoh increases, tells the Jews they have to gather their own straw, the activities of the enemies. The plagues, the manifestation of the power of God. Judgment of the firstborn. Disappointment by the Red Sea. Disappointment of the Millerites, October 23rd. Disappointment of Ezra, how few people came out of Babylon. Disappointment of the disciples after the cross. Just, and, and you did what? You did Noah? Yes. Noah. Pardon me? 1844. <clears throat> time of the end in the history of Noah. What did you mark as the time of the end? Pardon me? Methuselah. Okay. Um, Noah formalizes the message. I don't know about the uh, divine symbol that comes down in the power of the message, but you don't need it because the Bible says upon the testimony of two or three things established. You have the testimony of four here. It's established. And there is another one that we're going to deal with as we go forward with Revelation 18. Um, the scoffers resist the work of, of Noah. The animals get on the ark. Judgment takes place when the door is closed. And Noah is in the ark seven days before the rain begins. Um, and the Millerites have to understand the Sabbath. Christ rests on the human seventh day. 
line upon line, here a little, there a little. Um, John the Baptist proclaimed the foundational message in this history. The foundational the foundation of the temple was carried out in the first history of the first decree. William Miller set forth the foundations of Adventism. Moses, with his message of Sabbath, did you make this point? Set forth the, the foundational study of or message at that time was Sabbath. His message was worship. And Noah had to build a foundation to build the ark on before he could start building the ark. The foundation is always raised here in Isaiah 58 12. It says 144,000 are going to raise up the foundations of many generations. This is five generations. The reason that we're raising up this foundation is to be able to identify what is the foundational message for the 144,000 when this history is repeated. This is Noah, and this is the Nephites. We now want to take up Elijah. Okay, uh, I'm on page 31 of your notes. What you said, page 31? 31 of your notes. <laughs> And you'll, you'll see a reference in 1 Kings 18.1, it came to pass, at the top of your notes under the prophetic pattern, number four, and it came to pass, after many days, that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was sore famine in Samaria. Um, when is it that Elijah goes to confront Ahab? after the three and a half years of drought, right? Right. So, these, bringing these lines together identify certain characteristics. I mean, you don't have a, if you, you don't have a, a definite illustration of the manifestation of the power of God in the three decrees, but you don't need it because you have the manifestation of the power of God here with Christ, you have the manifestation of the power of God with the Millerites, you have the manifestation of the power of God with Moses and with Noah. So even though you don't see it illustrated there, upon the testimony of two or three, a thing is established, right? That's this this sequence of events is established this way. Um, so when it comes to these lines, we take truths that are identified in these lines and build upon them, line upon line, here a little, there a little. And what is the time of the end for the Millerites? And what concludes in 1798? The three and a half years of drought. Right? So this is a parallel down here with Elijah. Elijah's time of the end is at the end of the three and a half years of drought. And present situation. Are we not using this board because we realize it don't work? Okay, let, let me make one little point for you outside of this particular study. If this is Elijah here, and this is the time of the end for Elijah, at the end of three and a half years of drought, this is paralleling the Millerites. Their time of the end was at the end of three and a half years of dark age. Three and a half prophetic years is 1260 years. Now, brothers and sisters, this three and a half years of the dark age of the 1260 years, this is the fourth church in Revelation, seven churches. It's the church of Thyatira. If you understand that, say amen. amen. There's seven churches in Revelation, and the fourth church, Thyatira, represents this 1260 year period. And there is a symbol in the church of Thyatira that represents the papacy. What's that symbol? <laughs> Jezebel. Jezebel is ruling there in this, this drought time, just as Jezebel is ruling up here. Okay, these are parallel histories. The Elijah and the Millerites is important. That's why Sister White so often compares William Miller with Elijah. Okay? So we want to take note of that because some of the truths in the story of Elijah have a, a, a real important bearing for us here at the end of the world. Um, the first message for Elijah, a message of reform. Uh, remember the first convicts of sin, 
then righteousness is manifested, and then judgment is illustrated. Because the work of the Holy Spirit is to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The, the reform message of Elijah, you can see here in 1 Kings 18, verse 21, how long alter between two opinions. If the Lord be God, follow him, but if he fail, then follow him, and the people answer him not a word. So Elijah brings a reform message, and the second message is the activities of the enemies, and Elijah allows the prophets of Baal to go first. The enemies do their um, activities first. You can see that on your notes. We don't need to read this. I don't believe. And then, at the end of the day, after the prophets of Baal have hid their bands of deception throughout the day, then Elijah repairs the altar, covers it with water, and there's a manifestation of the power of God as fire comes down out of heaven and eliminates the altar. Now, one of the things that's being taught in this, or clearly portrayed in the story of Elijah is that in this testing process, and remember, the testing process here of Elijah is a, is a parallel to the testing process of the Millerites. All right? We want to see this. And when the fire comes down out of heaven and it illuminates the altar, what does it do? And I know you don't have the answer for this. You can't know the answer I'm looking for, but I'm the answer to make you think about What does the fire do? What it does is it identifies who's the true prophet. Okay, when, when that altar is lit up with fire, everyone knows that the true prophet is Elijah. It's not the prophets of Baal. And in this history of the Millerites, by the time you go to 1844, it has been identified that the true prophet in the history of the world at this point is Adventism. And the false prophet has arrived in history because in 1842, the Protestant churches begin to fulfill their role as the false prophet when they close their doors on the message of the hour. So in this history, the true prophet, Adventism, and the false prophet, the false prophet of Revelation 16, he's the Lord's army again, in conjunction with the dragon and the beast, is revealed. So there's one of the things that's taking place in this history of Elijah is the identification of the true and false prophet. Amen. Um, and then, then judgment is illustrated when the prophets are taken and slain. After the third main mark, what should we expect to see? Disappointment. Disappointment. And where do we see the disappointment? Do you think Elijah wanted to pray seven times for the rain, or did he just want to go pray one time? Lord, send the rain. He just wanted to pray one time, right? But he had to pray seven times for the rain. There's a disappointment illustrated there. No, no one had to wait seven days, right? No one had to wait seven days. You pointed that out, right? And Christ raised, rested in the tomb on the seventh day. So, somehow, number seven is connected with the disappointment. Do you notice how your understanding is? I know you don't get through your understanding. It's not that hard. Why don't you go through a few lines? I can start asking you, and you can, you can answer. And the, the fourth message, now all of, all of these lines are not necessarily so detailed as the others. Remember the fourth message in the time of Christ is Pentecost. Great Controversy 6, 11, Sister White compares Pentecost with the fourth angel's message of Revelation 18. And the work of Nehemiah in the fourth decree um, is paralleling the fourth angel's message. Nehemiah finished the streets and the walls even in troublous times, identifying the troublous times that take place during the latter reign. And those troublous times are specifically marked in Bible prophecy. Troublous times that Nehemiah is prefiguring is called the angering of the nations in Revelation 11, verse 18. Angering of the nations is a, a symbol for the role of Islam in Bible prophecy. It parallels the distress of nations that took place in the Millerite history. Revelation 11, 18, right? Right. And, and concluded in 1840. The fourth, the fourth way mark in the history of, of Moses was Pentecost. Did Brother Jamal point out that? The beginning of ancient Israel is identical to the end of ancient Israel. We want to point that out. 
because we're going to talk about what the seven thunders represent. And the seven thunders is the truth that is sealed up in the book of Revelation. And in Revelation 22, 11, we have the close of probation with the pronouncement, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And in verse 10, which comes right before the close of probation, in Revelation 22, 11, in verse 10 it says, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Just before the close of probation, according to Revelation 22, 10 and 11, there comes a pronouncement to unseal the prophecy in the book of Revelation that has been sealed up. And the only prophecy in the book of Revelation that's been sealed up is the seven thunders. And Sister White tells us that the seven thunders represents the history of the Millerites from 1840 to 1844, and future events that will be disclosed in their order. The seven thunders represent the prophetic principle that the beginning of Adventism perfectly parallels the end of Adventism. The Millerite history is repeated to the very letter in the history of the 144,000. But Adventism is modern Israel, and the best symbol of modern Israel is ancient Israel. And the beginning of ancient Israel with Moses is identical to the end of ancient Israel in the history of Christ. So when we're saying that the seven thunders represents the truth that the beginning of Adventism is identical to the end of Adventism, then what we're saying is the seven thunders represents that the beginning of modern Israel is identical to the end of modern Israel. And it's got a second witness with the fact that the beginning of ancient Israel is identical to the end of ancient Israel. We don't want to pass over that truth because the seven thunders is the prophetic truth that is unsealed for the 144,000 and parallel unsealing of the book of Daniel for the Millerites. The fourth way mark for Elijah is the rain. Um, and the fourth way mark for Noah is the rain. Do we all see? How these lines run. And Elijah here, when he gets here, what does he do? He identifies the foundational message. We read it. Choose whether God is God or Baal is God. The foundational message of the history of Carmel is which God are you going to choose? If you understand the basic logic of these lines, say amen. Yes. Yes. Okay. We want to make some points from the from the story of Elijah before we move on. At the bottom of page, I didn't I didn't pay attention to when I started. Did someone? So, okay, so we have twenty three minutes. On the bottom of page thirty two, when we're talking about the the fire coming down in Carmel. Um, we want to identify what the altar and the fire is. And from Ye Shall Receive Power, page 178, it says, The true altar is Christ, and the true fire is the Holy Spirit. Fire is the Holy Spirit. We, we know there's an altar and a fire in the story of Elijah, and I'm not going to make too much of a point about that here, but I'm going to put it into our, our understanding, because, Lord willing, before this week is over, we're going to look at Revelation 8, verses 1 through 6. For the seventh seal is open, and we'll see there an altar and some fire, and we want to know in advance what the altar and the fire represent in order to make sense of what the seventh seal is all about. Um, after, after Elijah runs to Jezreel in front of Ahab, and then Jezebel threatens him, we know that he runs away from fear. He's not supposed to do this, but he does do this, and he ends up war, worn out in a cave, correct? Now, I think probably Jamal and I have said this before, but I'm going to say it again, just, just to remind us. What we're dealing with here at a, at a very simple level is the 3-1 combination. The three angels' messages that came into history in the Millerite history only to be followed at the end of the world with the fourth angel's message. This three-one combination is it's separated. I have a, I know a brother that just fights against what we teach, and he fights against this particular point because he says the Lord doesn't use numbers to illustrate things. But that isn't the point. I'm not saying that this that this is a three-one combination. I'm using the three-one combination to try to illustrate these waymarks. So let's not stumble over over the the numbers of it. 
these three messages come into history, and there's a break in time, and then the fourth message arrives. And when you see the three one combination in the scriptures, there's invariably this distinction between the fourth and the first three Noah and his three sons. Um, Balaam's three blessings. Remember, King Balak hired Balaam to curse Israel. But he didn't curse Israel, he pronounced three blessings. And then what happened? Nope. King Balak was disappointed after the third blessing and said, go home. But before he went home, then Balaam pronounced the fourth blessing. Okay? When you see these three one combinations throughout the Bible, and we haven't mentioned all of them, they represent, they're telling us that this particular passage of truth has a direct contribution to the story of Adventism, because that's what the story of Adventism is, is the three angels' messages followed by the four. Um, in a conversation we were having last night after the meetings, the subject of Job came up, and we know that Sister White says that if we're faithful, every earthly support is to be what? Cut off. cut off. And the symbol of every earthly being support being cut off of the 144,000 is Job, and the story of Job is the story of Job and his three friends. When you see this three one combination, it's a, it's a prophetic clue saying this is a piece of information right here that contributes to our understanding of Adventism. And in, in Elijah's fleeing to the cave, he sees, he's afraid of Jezebel, and he sees three things take place in the cave. What, what are they? You can see them represented on page 33. The wind, the earthquake, and the fire. But the Lord wasn't in those three things. Where was he? No. He was in the still, small voice. Now, the point is, is this is a 3-1 combination. It's telling us that this particular piece of information is what we are to understand. But even though we're, we're told in the story that the, the, the Lord wasn't in the fire, the wind, and the earthquake, you can show from the scriptures that the fire represents the Holy Spirit, and the wind represents the Holy Spirit, and the earthquake represents the Holy Spirit. So this, these are all, these four items are all talking about the Holy Spirit. And what Elijah needs to learn is what we are supposed to learn. And what we're supposed to learn is that God speaks to us through a still, small voice. Right? Right. Okay. Now, if I talk this, at this level, is that a still, small voice? Not quite as, it's not quite as good. What's a still small voice? What is the still small voice? Brothers and sisters, whatever the still small voice is, according to Elijah, it's the Holy Spirit. That's what this three one combination is teaching. So Elijah, representing God's people at the end of the world, and we've read a quote where Elijah represents God's people at the end of the world, he has to understand the still small voice. And brothers and sisters, I'll tell you what the, the stillest voice is. You know what it is? But it's God's voice. It's the still small voice. That's how God speaks to His people in the gathering time period. It's through the still small voice. And God's people have to understand that. And in the story of Elijah, it's teaching us that we really don't know what the latter rain is at the end of the world. But we have to know what the latter rain is. And this is definitely a message for us. Because we know about the triple application prophecy, although we haven't dealt with it here. In Bible prophecy is structured by a triple application prophecy. And when a prophecy is repeated three times, the first two times it's repeated will identify the characteristics of the third and final fulfillment. And a classic example of that is the three Elijahs. Elijah the first, take the characteristics of Elijah the first, you combine them with Elijah the second. And who's Elijah the second? John And you will identify Elijah the third. And who's Elijah the third? God's people at the end of the world. So in this story of Elijah, we know this story about the three-one combination there in the cave is about us at the end of the world. And if you turn to page 34 of your notes, um, on the top of page 34 of the notes, it says, John recalled the prophecy concerning the Messiah. This is John the Baptist. He's questioning whether Jesus is really the Messiah. 
John recalled, questioning to himself, the prophecy concerning the Messiah, Jehovah hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the year of Jehovah's favor, and to comfort all that mourn. The evidence of his divinity was seen in his ministry to the needs of suffering humanity. His glory was shown in his condensation to our lowest state. The works of Christ not only declared him to be the Messiah, but showed in what manner his kingdom was to be established. To John was open the same truth that had come to Elijah in the desert when the great and strong wind rent the mountains and break the pieces. Dropping down to the next paragraph. It says, the kingdom of God comes with not, not with outward show, it comes through the gentleness of the inspiration of his word, through the inward working of his spirit, the fellowship of the soul with him who is its life. The greatest manifestation of its power is seen in human nature, brought to perfection, is seen in human nature, brought to the perfection of the character of Christ. Amen. Both Elijah and John the Baptist had to understand this experience of the cave, what, what it was, what is the latter rain power, because Elijah and John the Power, Baptist are representing the 144,000 at the end of the world, and the 144,000 at the end of the world, according to Zechariah and other passages. The one thing that we misunderstand when they are being raised up is what the Holy Spirit is. Okay? We think the Holy Spirit is, let's all get together and pray for the Holy Spirit on the seventh day of the seventh month of the year 2007. Because we got 777, the Holy Spirit will be poured out. Brothers and sisters, that isn't the Holy Spirit. Sister White said that one of the ways that we parallel the work of the Jews in crucifying Christ, and this is a paraphrase, but I have the quote with me. The Jews crucified Christ from a misunderstanding of prophecy, and one of the ways that Adventism will misunderstand prophecy and parallel the crucifixion of Christ is by believing that we can wait for the latter rain for character perfection. We put off the work of overcoming our sins until the latter rain is poured out. And in that way, we are misunderstanding prophecy, and she says that's paralleling the crucifixion of Christ. So, what I'm saying is the latter rain, a misunderstanding of the latter rain, is a subject of the latter rain in Bible prophecy. It's illustrated. Elijah is demonstrating that he had to come to understand that the Holy Spirit was not these powerful manifestations, but it was delivered through God's Word. And John the Baptist, the second Elijah, had to come to the same understanding. That was the same test. That's what the quote says here, as Elijah had. Right. Now, when Elijah comes out of the cave, <clears throat> he had to do three anointings, all right? He had to anoint Haziel, Jehu, and Elisha. And it's, it's, Elisha's an easy one. When he anoints Elijah, we know who Elisha is, right? right. Um, there's a there's a one-two illustration in Bible prophecy, okay? It's illustrated several places. I'll give you the basic breakdown of it. John the Baptist brings a message of reform, and it's followed by the message of Christ. And in the message of Christ, you have the manifestations of the miracles of Christ. That's been illustrated by Elijah, who brings the message of reform, who was followed by Elisha, who did many more miracles than Elijah. Okay? The, the reform, the conviction of sin, the reform message, produces righteousness in those that respond to the reform message. It's the one two step that's illustrated there. And so Elijah, when Elijah anoints Elisha at the end of the world, it's identifying the empowerment of the 144,000. How the Holy Spirit is poured out on that. That's an easy one to see. But the interesting ones to see is Hazael and Jehu. On the page 34, <clears throat> You'll see, you'll see in the middle of the three anointings where Sister White comments on Elijah being told to anoint these three persons. And then you're going to see a comment under Haziel where Sister White's going to tell us who the Haziels are at the end of the world. And they will be here, and they are here. It says, many of our people are lukewarm. They occupy the position of Maros, neither for nor against, neither cold nor hot. 
had, had a discussion with a friend this morning about the fact that we're in a crisis situation in Adventism, and I pointed out to him that he knew this. He says, <clears throat> what's the worst form of apostasy in a crisis? Neutrality in a religious crisis is the worst form of apostasy against God. Sister Lord says, and she's, this is an illustration of what she's talking about here. Many of our people are lukewarm. They occupy the position of marrows, neither for nor against, neither cold nor hot. They hear the words of Christ, but do them not. If they remain in this state, he will reject them with abhorrence. Many of those who have had great light, great opportunities, and every spiritual advantage praise Christ and the world with the same breath. They bow themselves before God and them. They make merry with the children of the world, and yet claim to be blessed with the children of God. They wish to have Christ as their Savior, but will not bear the cross or wear his yoke and wear his yoke. May the Lord have mercy upon you, for if you go on in this way, nothing but evil can be prophesied concerning you. The patience of God has an object, but you are defeating it. He is allowing a state of things to come to you that would fail that you would fain see counteracted by and by, but it will be too late. God commanded Elijah to anoint the cruel and deceitful Hazael king over Syria, that he might be a scourge to idolatrous Israel. This is taking place in this history, the history of Elijah, which is not only the history of the Millerites, but it's the history of the 144,000. Okay? Hazael is going to be anointed. <clears throat> she says, God commanded Eliza to anoint the cruel and deceitful Hazael king over Syria, that he might be a scourge to idolatrous Israel. Who knows whether God will not give you up to the deceptions you love? Who knows but the, that the preachers who are faithful, firm, and true may be the last who shall offer the gospel of peace to our unthankful churches? It may be that the destroyers, who are the destroyers? Hazael. She's talking about Hazael. It may be that the destroyers are already training under the hand of Satan and only wait for the departure of a few more standard bearers to take their places and with the voice of the false prophet. Who's the false prophet? The United States. Apostate Protestantism. And with the voice of the false prophet cry peace, peace, when the Lord has not spoken, to, spoken peace. I seldom weep. But now I find my eyes blinded with tears. They are falling upon my paper as I write. It may be ere long that ere long all prophesying among us will be at an end, and the voice which has stirred the people may no longer disturb their carnal slumbers. When God shall work his strange work upon earth, when holy hands bear the ark no longer, woe will be upon the people. Oh, that thou hadst known, even thou, in this thy day, the things that belong unto thy peace, oh, that our people may, as did Nineveh, repent with all their might and believe with all their heart that God may turn away his fierce anger from them. Brothers and sisters, Hazael is anointed in Adventism at the end of the world, and Hazael are the preachers that have learned the gospel of apostate Protestantism and are teaching the gospel of apostate Protestantism in Adventism at the end of time, and they are a scourge to idolatry, idolatry Israel. Are there any preachers in Adventism that are teaching the gospel of false prophets? Mm -hmm. yeah. We're in that time period. They're a scourge to Adventism. Brothers and sisters, they are a scourge to Adventism. But Elijah also anointed the children. Those, those preachers, preachers in Adventism that are represented by Hazael in the terminology that we use in Adventism today, you know who they are? They're the liberal pastors. Okay? They're the Desmond Fordites and those type of pastors. They're the liberals. Jehu's one of those guys. Jehu. It was because of his love for Aryan Israel that God permitted the Syrians to scourge them. It was because of his compassion for those whose moral power was weak that he raised up Jehu to slay the wicked Jezebel and all the house of Ahab. Jehu is doing his work for the Lord. And Jehu is on the right side of the issue. 
Let's see what she says about Jehu. Next quote. Men are slow to learn the lesson that the spirit manifested by Jehu will never bind hearts together. It is not safe for us to bind our interests with our Jehu religion, for this will result in bringing sadness upon the heart of God's true workers. God has not given to any of his servants the work of punishing those who need not heed his warnings and reproof. Jehu is someone that takes upon himself the work of punishing those people that are outside the orthodoxy of Adventism. Jehu is not a liberal pastor. Jehu is the one that understands the straight and narrow, the blueprint of Adventism, and he's zealous to guard that blueprint. He does so. Of course, the reality is, is that Jehu was a Pharisee, and the Pharisees really didn't know what the law of God was. She's going to compare him to the Pharisees. Jehu is representing conservative Adventism. Ministries that have taken upon themselves the work of identifying the heretics in Adventism. And not just identifying them, but making sure they cover their faces. <laughs> They're out there just as the AZLs out there, brothers and sisters. They're out there. The Pharisee, the Jehu spirit, next quote. Luke 18, verse 11 and 12. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this public, and I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. There are many who religion, whose religion consists in activities. They want to be engaged in and have credit for doing some great work, while the little graces that go to make up a lovely Christian character are entirely <coughs> overlooked. The busy, bustling service, which gives the impression that one is doing some wonderful work, is not acceptable to God. It is the Jehu spirit which says, Come see my zeal for the Lord. It is gratifying to self. It feeds a self-complacent doom, but all the while the soul may be defiled with the place by unsubdued, uncontrolled selfishness. By their fruit you shall know them. Christ has not been revealed in your deportment towards some of you who were much nearer the kingdom of heaven than yourselves. The Lord has opened before you your wrong toward his children, your want of mercy and love, your determination to control minds and make them see things just as you see them. <clears throat> and when light came to you, what course did you take? Did you merely admit that you were wrong, or did you hardly confess your error and humble your proud hearts before God? Did you cast aside, aside your ways and accept God's teaching? Did you go to the very ones you have bruised and wounded and said, I've been wrong, I've sinned against you, forgive me, I've failed, I work in my own spirit. I had a zeal, but not according to knowledge. It was the spirit of Jehu rather than the meekness and lowliness of Christ. The word of God directs, confess your faults one to another. And pray for one another that you may be healed. Will you pray for me that God will forgive me for the distress and anguish I have caused you? Brothers and sisters, there are just as many Jehu's out in heaven even in the days of our Israel. I don't think it's a movie, but they're out there. They're out there, and they are those that are the defenders of orthodoxy. But they are Pharisees. They're, they're, they're the Jehu's in this, in this line of prophecy of Elijah. But in this line of prophecy, they're the Pharisees. And we know from the testimony of the Pharisees, they thought they knew what orthodoxy was. But did they? No. No, they didn't. They had a zeal for the Lord. But it was not a holy zeal. In the next quote, she compares Jehu with Korah, Gatham, and the Bible. When Elijah anoints Elisha. We have a third anointing that's identified in this history. And under Elisha, from manuscript reads in volume 20, page 350, it says, There's a great work to be done in a short time. The Lord would take men from the pile, even as he took Elisha, and he would give them a part in the closing work. Elisha, from what we've been suggesting here, Elisha is the stammering tongues. Isaiah 28. With another tongue shall I speak to these people. It's those that are called from the proud, which is the white speech there, that are anointed in the history of the fourth, Waymar, 
in the history of the outpouring of the latter rain, that Elisha is represented. Uh, and she's, she's emphasizing that a great work will be done in a short time. She says this in the next quote, a great work will be done in a short time. A message will soon be given by God's appointment that will swell into a loud cry. Then Daniel will stand in the plot to give his testimony. This loud cry is the fourth angel's message. Christ's ministry lasted only three years, and a great work was done in that short period. In these last days, there is a great work to be done in a short time. And what is the work that's done in a short time? Christ's object lessons, page 69. I'm sure that we all know this. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he put it in the sickle, because the harvest has come. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in the church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim him as his own. This is the work that gets accomplished in a short period of time, in the time period when Elijah is anointing both all not both, anointing Hazael, Jehu, and Elijah. In the latter end time period, and I've been trying to emphasize this all the way through. There's going to be false teachers. There's going to be a shaking. There's going to be a resistance. And the resistance to this message in Adventism comes from both conservative and liberal Adventism. Liberal Adventism with their foolish ideas that they got from apostate Protestantism. And Jehu, those in conservative Adventism, the war against the latter rain message because it doesn't agree with their understanding of what the latter rain message is and therefore it isn't orthodox and they're attacking. It isn't an argument for what the latter rain message is. But brothers and sisters, and this is a count, it's an argument, but this message that we're sharing here this week, it gets attacked that way from both sides of the spectrum. It's attacked that way from both sides of the spectrum. Line upon line, from here to there, bring together. And the reason that we brought it together, and we're, and we're pretty much concluded this, this thought here, so we can start developing other points. Because every reform movement parallels all the other reform movements, and the final reform movement that we need to understand is the reform movement of the 144,000. And the reform movement of the 144,000, based upon the testimony of two or three, it will consist of a time and again. The reform movement of the 144,000 will start with the fulfillment of a prophecy. And that fulfillment of prophecy will shed light upon the upcoming history. The time of the end arrived for Adventism at the end of the world in 1989 with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the fulfillment of Daniel 11, verse 40. When the king of the north conquered the king of the south, it marked that the king of the north had begun its work of conquering three geographical obstacles, the king of the south, the glorious land, and Egypt. Before pagan Rome took control of the world, it had to conquer Syria, Egypt, and Israel. Before papal Rome took control of the world, it had to conquer the hero life, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals. Before modern Rome takes control of the world, he has to conquer the king of the south, the glorious man, and Egypt. And in 1989, when the papacy swept away the Soviet Union with an alliance between the United States of America, the first of those three steps had been fulfilled. Verse 40 was fulfilled. A prophecy was fulfilled. And suddenly, there was increasing light upon the upcoming history. And the upcoming history is that the papacy is to return to the throne of the earth and the world is about to be confronted with the test of the mark of the beast. The time of the end had arrived. There was an increase of knowledge on this subject. In 2001, there was a mighty angel that came down out of heaven and empowered this message. When the third woe arrived in history, and the mighty building of New York City was thrown down. And then Sister White says, Revelation 18, verse 1 through 3, was fulfilled. The next thing to happen, by the way, 
in 2001. The Twin Towers. That was a worldwide event. The next thing to happen is a Sunday law in the USA. That's global. This parallels the Millerite history perfectly. Because when the mighty angel of Revelation 10 came down, it's when the four great European powers of Europe put a restraint upon Islam. And on September 11, 2001, the whole world put a restraint upon Islam. And the United States went into Afghanistan and Iraq. Parallel history, there's more to be said. But this event in 1840 was worldwide. Sister White said that in 1840, the first angel's message was carried to every mission station in the world, and the next way mark was that the Protestants in the United States closed their door on the message. Worldwide, angel comes down. Worldwide, angel comes down. Protestants in the United States closed their door. Protestants in the United States closed their door. Midnight cry. Midnight cry in Miller history, paralleling an outcry that begins with the Sunday law in the United States. The midnight cry in Millerite history ended when judgment began on October 22, 1844. And the loud cry ends when judgment closes and Michael stands up. Disappointment followed. Disappointment followed. Time of Jacob's trouble. Adventism needed to understand the Sabbath, and thus the number seven. And Michael stands up, the seven last plagues arrive. Brothers and sisters, these histories are illustrating a history that's already underway, and it's identified that the Lord is finishing a work that we just read happens in a very short period of time. It's the anointing of Elisha. It's the raising up of 144,000. There has never been a more serious Father, we realize that we're in troublous times, and the streets and walls are about to be finished by the Nehemiah. We know that you're going to finish the work of righteousness, and that you're willing to finish the work that you've begun in each of us. And we ask that you accomplish that work in our lives, that you point out to us that we must set aside things, we must put aside differences between one another and press together. We need to discern that you know which way to walk. But we know that from the prophetic word that you've, you've taken up this work. Anointed Elisha, Hazael, and Jehiel. And we wish nothing more than, than to be part of this work. We ask that you continue to give us the light to follow that we can be part of this, this work. We wish that you continue to pour out your spirit and not only power upon us at this time, that we can pray for the latter rain and the time of the latter rain. And we ask that you continue to bless him in this prophecy spirit and his glory. We thank you for being with us so far. In Jesus' name.